Thank you, Kevin, for taking us to the Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that is a good place to go and to, to meditate and reflect that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that you may be reconciled to him. Is that not awesome or what? God is a God of peace and wants to make peace with, with us, and he does that through the person and work of Jesus Christ, and uh, we are so, so thankful for that. Zechariah chapters 4 through 6 is where we're going to be. This morning, before we get there, a um, couple, couple notes, a couple thoughts for you today. Um, welcome to June. We're here. We made it. Good job, you guys. This year is just flying by, is it not? So uh, it's good to be here in the air conditioning with you. And SRP is our sponsor for this morning. So <laughs> thank you, SRP, uh, for allowing us to gather today. Um, Want to let you know that, uh, that Kim Oliver and Marianne Levitt do a fantastic job with our kids' ministry. So I just want to, they're, they're not even here to receive that applause. They're in the back tending to the, to the kids, and uh, they do a fantastic job volunteering their time. So that the kids, uh, the kids back there, it's not just babysitting, it's actual intentional discipleship, trying to teach them the the ways and the words of Jesus, and I'm just so grateful for those those uh, those two. They are they are servants like like none other, and uh, and I promise them all the time. I'm going to go to bat for them. I'm going to I'm going to provide for them whatever they need, whatever resources they need to to make ministry easy for them. And as you can imagine, um, there's a there's a decent amount of turnover with kids ministry. Um, it's it's one of those. Uh, not likely to be appreciated to kind of ministries. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a barista could serve you a latte, and you're like, hey, fine job on that, on that latte. You know, the pastor can deliver a great message. You say, thank you, pastor, for, for giving us a good encouragement today. Kids aren't going to thank you for, for, to, to look out for them. And so it's oftentimes a thankless ministry. And, uh, and I know that I have to always weigh my motives and, and prepare my heart to, to realize that what I do is for the Lord. My applause is from him. Amen. Don't need, we need to realize that there's an audience of one. His name is Jesus and he will reward whatever faithful service it's done, uh, in his name. And, and that's what we're, we're waiting for is to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But, uh, I told Kim and Marianne, I'm going to go to bat for them. And you know what? We always need volunteers, people to help out with the kids ministry, uh, we do a background check on all of our volunteers. We try to provide a, a safe uh, environment for, for all the people that are involved in the ministry. And so uh, because of just the nature of the, of the ministry, turnover, things like that, I'm going to just put a little hard sell on you guys this morning to sign up and help out with kids ministry. Because one thing I don't want to do is just close those doors on a Sunday and say, sorry, we don't have people to help you with your kids. And then we've got crying kids out there, which is a distraction. Amen. I mean, it's enough that you guys get up and, go, and down, go to the bathroom and get lattes all the time, right, during the messages. It's another thing when you just have kids uh, out here, and we, that's why we try to provide a, an age-specific ministry to them. So, um, so on one hand, for those of you that maybe can volunteer a Sunday a month, which is nothing, Kim and Marianne would love to hear from you, put you on the schedule, get you back there uh, with some regularity to help out. Number two is if you're a parent of a child, here's what I'm going to tell you this morning, and this is from me, not from Kim or Marianne. Uh, if you have a, p a child back there, we are asking you to also sign up one Sunday a month. Uh, number one, it's good to be back there with your kids. Number two, it's good to know what your kids are learning back there. And number three, you're taking advantage of the ministry. You might as well give back to the ministry as well. Amen? So if you're a parent of a child, here's what I want you to do. I want you to let Marianne or Kim know when you can serve once a month. Because here's what I don't want them to do. I don't want them to have to chase you. You go to them. They've got enough stuff going on, right? Every, every Sunday, every week. Go to them and just volunteer your time at least one Sunday a month. So I don't think that's too much to ask. Amen? Right? It's almost like, Pastor, you know, I, I come up here almost every Sunday and deliver a message to you guys. And, uh, you know, the one, the one term, phrase you hear in the church is, you know what, I'm not going to that church anymore because it doesn't feed me. You know, oh, the pastor there feeds me, and I'm glad to feed you guys. But the question is, who feeds the pastor? You guys ever thought about that? Who feeds me? Guess what, I feed myself. 
I come to a point in my journey where it's like, you know what, I don't have to be constantly served. I have to, I, I'm going to give my life to serve others. And this is one area back there where you can go and feed others and serve others and give of your time and your attention and your talents and your treasure and all that. So uh, that is the infomercial of the morning. No more after that. Help out with kids ministry. Kim and Marianne would be so appreciative. If you need a connection to them, since they're not out here right now, Lori, raise your hand. My wife will gently guide you to Kim and Marianne's presence so you can talk to them and find out a little bit more about the ministry. Is that good? Is that a good word? Uh, anything I can add to that, honey? Or another child. One, one of those two things. We have that many? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that's right. We do. Yeah, and I'm going to go to bat for my wife. She serves this church in incredible ways. She shouldn't have to, right? She's going to do it because that's the way Lord, her love language is, you know, it, acts of service, right? Um, and I'm going to just tell you guys right now, like, Free my wife up. She says that, but I don't want her to serve back there. You want to know why? Because then she's going to take a spot that someone in here needs to serve, right? Someone who's not serving right now. So fat bodies, fit minds. That's the problem in the church today. <laughs> fat bodies, fit minds. Get, get doing something, right? So you guys like that, don't you? Tweet that. That's cool. It's the title of a book, I, I, I admit right now, but um, good word, yeah. Love you. I should have said, I should have asked, like, Lori, you have a comment. Not ask her if she had a comment, because Lori's always good with a word. So, Lori, do you have anything to add? Of course she does. Let's just go, go ahead and add something. So, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, the volunteers that just make Sunday after Sunday just go. And uh, so appreciative of them. And uh, for the work that you're doing by means of your spirit and your word, it is awesome to, to be a part of. Uh, guide our hearts and our minds now through... Zechariah, wonderful, wonderful passages we get to look at today. Be glorified in this time. Thank you for Jesus that makes it possible. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Zechariah 4, 5, and 6 is where we're going to be this morning. Um, USA Today released uh, an article this past week and had done some research. And the article in USA Today said this, that going to church is healthy for you. So I, I imagine an uptick in attendance this Sunday, but, uh, you know, we're, we're doing okay. But um, a recent study by Vanderbilt University professor Mar Marino Bruce has found that people who attend religious services live longer and are less stressed. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? Think about it. So he said, we found that in our study that actually attending church is good for your health, particularly for those who are between the ages of 40 and 65. We got a representation of that group here? Okay, we're doing all right, guys. We're doing all right. I'm, I'm lumped into that category, believe it or not. Some of you are like, Scott, you're between 40 and 65? Um, the researcher said this, for those who did not attend church at all, were twice as likely to die prematurely than those who did who attend church at some point over the last year. So give it up to your neighbor. Hey, glad you're here. Looking forward to living longer with you this, this, coming, this coming year. So, um, and, and I want to tell you that it is all well and good to attend church. And there may be some health benefits that are derived from attending a worship service. But one thing that God wants more than your attendance is your heart. Okay? Write this down. God wants your heart, not your works. God wants your heart, 
not your ritual. God wants your heart, not your rules. God wants your heart, not your actions. God, fill in the blank. See, I think while this study may be well and good and true, one thing that Jesus always emphasized is this. You could go to church every day and twice on Sunday. Doesn't mean you're in good with God. See, you can attend church every day and twice on Sunday and still not have a heart that desperately yearns after God. And you're no better than the person who never sets foot in a church. Because what we need to understand is that church attendance, church participation, church work is not the end all be all. What is the end all be all that scripture from Genesis to Revelation continues to point us to is that God wants your heart more than he wants anything else. That's why he said, why do you honor me with your lips, externals, and not know me and love me from your heart, internals? See, what we are always trying to aim at is that the inside of who and who you are and who I am is what's critically important. And we have to understand that God is more concerned about our heart than any sort of religious duty or obligation or action that any one of us could participate in. Amen? That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if I go out and I speak with the tongue of angels but have not love, what am I? Nothing. Right? We have to, we have to realize that we live in a world that loves to have the list of do's and don'ts and the checklist and to make sure that we've done enough But here's the good news is that Jesus has done it all already. And you and I don't have to do anything but yet live in relationship with him. And this is the message of the gospel. This is the message of the Bible. This is the message of Zechariah. We're spending five weeks in Zechariah because it is a prophet I felt like we didn't need, we didn't have to rush through. And Zechariah is aimed at the heart of God's people. And it is an incredible joy to stand before you every Sunday and unpack the word and share with you the truths that are contained therein. Because it is an opportunity for me to encourage your hearts to hopefully instill hope and to let you know that God loves you as you are where you are. But he's also going to be a God who's going to transform you and make you into a better person tomorrow than you were today. And that's the beauty of God's faithful work to his people. So this morning, we look at Zechariah 4, 5, and 6. We're going to notice three more pictures of Jesus, how Jesus appears and arrives in the Old Testament, makes himself known. And overall, in Zechariah, I think we're going to have about 15 portraits of Christ. Last week, we looked at four. Today, we're going to look at three. Here they are. We're going to see Jesus as the empowering one. We're going to see Jesus as the delivering one. And we're going to see Jesus as the crowned one. Empowering, delivering, and crowned. Now what's amazing about these truths is that we would require some discipline to really study these passages. Because what we're going to read this morning will leave you kind of maybe baffled, maybe scratching your head, maybe a little bit dumbfounded. Because the Old Testament imagery is somewhat confusing to our 21st century mindset. And so this morning what I look forward to is kind of unpacking the historical and cultural truths that are contained within Zechariah and show you how they point to the personal work of Jesus Christ. And then I want to draw some application out of it as we, as we go along. So turn to Zechariah chapter 4, and perhaps one of the most familiar passages from Zechariah appears here In verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I used to have a shirt when I was in high school. Yeah, I was a Jesus freak in my junior and senior year. But I had a verse, a shirt that had this verse on it. It was a great reminder, even though the kids at my public school looked at me like weird, like, you know, like, what is Zechariah? What does that even mean, right? But the more I've grown in Christ, the more I've really understood the truth, and I continue to understand the truth, that Jesus is the empowering one. Look at chapter 4 of Zechariah, first, verse 1. Now you remember, context-wise, Zechariah and Haggai 
two prophets encouraging the people to resume the work of building God's temple. They had started with zeal, they had started with enthusiasm, but that waned, uh, their desires died off. Haggai and Zechariah come along to to once again instill a sense of uh, reinvigoration for the work of God. And Zechariah is just here to motivate the people to do the work that God has commissioned them to do, the work that he set them free to do. Verse 1, chapter 4, Then the angel of the Lord was speaking with me, returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on top of it. And it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also are two olive trees by it, one on the right side and the other on the left. And I answered and said to the angel who was speaking to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And I answered and said to the angel, what are these, my Lord? We already read that verse. Verse 5. So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Verse 6. Then he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountains, before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain? And he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the house. His hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I answered the second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? And he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No. It's like the angel's playing a trick with them. Like they're going back and forth, right? Verse 14, and he said, These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. And this is only the first part. Jesus is the empowering one. To sum up chapter 4, we need to understand the message that Zechariah is preaching to the people is this. That God, by means of his spirit, offers his people unending empowerment to do God's work. Okay, so here's the picture by which this is communicated to Zechariah, the prophet, being shared to Zerubbabel, the political leader, to Joshua, the spiritual leader, is this. This picture of lampstands and oil in the temple. And if you understand Old Testament history, the, the lamps in the temple were continually lit. And it was the responsibility of the priest to make sure every morning, every night, that the wicks were trimmed and there was enough oil to light the lamps. And so the priest, on a continual rotating basis, would go in and make sure that the wicks were where they needed to be and there was enough oil supply for those lamps to remain burning bright. And what God is communicating is he's taking that message of this temple work and he's saying, More than just making sure that the wicks are trimmed and the bowls are full of oil, you need to realize as his people, God offers an unending supply of his power to do what he wants you to do. And we need to be reminded of this, that Jesus is the empowering one. Did you know that when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, you trust him? as your Lord and your Savior. You believe in Him as your Redeemer. The things that we celebrated in communion, that what Christ promises you is His presence now dwelling within you by means of His Holy Spirit. Every person in this room who has believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior has now been deposited within with God's Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit within us. This is a gift of God where he says to us, I will will not leave you alone. I will give you the spirit who will guide you into truth. I will give you the spirit that will convict you of sin. I will give you the spirit to do 
what in your eyes and your mind seems impossible. But with God, we know that nothing is impossible. Right? Because he's the power who raised his son from the, the grave. He's the God who created the cosmos and the universe and sustains it even at this moment. Now we have that power living within us. But sometimes we forget the power that resides within. Sometimes we do it on our own. We try to execute the work of God by our own power. And guess what ends up happening? We end up burning ourselves out. Amen? I struggle personally because as a communicator of the word of God, how I am so tempted week to week to week to prepare my message and go, Is this a good opener? Is this a good illustration? Is this a good quote? And thinking that my wisdom and my talents and my skills is going to bring the message to to you and be everything that God wants it to be. See, I can can lean on articulation. I can lean on eloquence. I can lean on education and experience. But if God's not involved in the process, it doesn't bring Him glory. Glory. And you need to be honest, I need to be honest with you, that is a week-to-week temptation. It's to so prepare a message for you from God where His Spirit is not involved. That's the difficulty in being involved in the craft that I'm involved in. And how I get up here and want to lean on not what I've prepared, but be relying upon the Spirit, that is a difficult place to continue to go to we are desperate for churches we are desperate for ministries we are desperate for people who are fully yielded and dependent upon the spirit of god where at the end of the day we can't take credit for anything but we can only point heavenward and say it is all of god amen but how the spirit works is a mystery jesus equated the spirit to to the wind Remember in John chapter 3, his conversation with Nicodemus? You don't know where the wind's coming from. You don't know where the wind's going. And it reminds me of an illustration when I was in high school. I was involved in, the, in a youth group, and one of the guys in the youth group had a sailboat, and he took some kids out uh, to Lake Pleasant, and we were sailing. And what's amazing, it was my first time ever on a sailboat, sailboat maybe, maybe my only time ever on a sailboat. So if you have a sailboat, let's go out sometime. I'd love to recapture that sense of wonder once again, right? So we're out on the sailboat, right? And what's amazing is you're out there, and... You don't understand how powerful the wind is. Maybe you can feel a little bit of breeze. But as soon as you hoist that sail and allow that sail to pick up the wind, it can begin to carry you at quick speeds. If you've ever been on a sailboat, the bigger the mass, the faster you go, right? Because you want to capture as much of that wind as possible. And I just remember Ron, that was the guy's name. As soon as he lifted that sail and threw up that mass, we just took off. And I thought to myself, this is powerful. Something invisible, something we can't see, but yet we see the effects of it. We feel the effects of it. And this is what the Bible continues to point to, is the work of the Spirit, that which we do not see, but we can't see evidence of the work of the Spirit. But we as followers of Jesus must continue to understand the Spirit's work within us. We must understand the Spirit's work around us and so what Zechariah gets a picture of is a picture of the fact that we are to never do the work of God apart from utter dependency upon the Holy Spirit of God there was a guy named Vance Havner he was a pastor he said this I love this quote listen to this we say we depend on the Holy Spirit But actually, we are so wired up with our own devices that if the fire does not fall from heaven, we can turn on a switch and produce false fire of our own. If there is no sound of a rushing mighty wind, we have the furnace all set to blow hot air instead. God save us from our synthetic Pentecost. Oh my goodness! It's true, isn't it? And perhaps we, in our first world culture, are the most susceptible to the dangers of thinking we're good with God, but we're not. I mean, think about the cultures that are so dependent on praying 
that they don't have the resources or, or the resources or the means to go get something that they need, and they, they pray about it, and all of a sudden that thing that they need is given to them. See, we pray, and if it doesn't happen within two hours, we just go to the store and buy what we need. We just go to Amazon and order it's on our doorstep the next morning. I mean, think about it, how many of us are producing false fire. And there's a synthetic Pentecost happening, and we think we're good. And God reminds us and says, my work will be done by my spirit or will have no eternal significance. That's haunting. I want the things that I'm engaged in to be so not only glorifying to God, but so spirit-empowered that ultimately God is the only one that gets the glory. Because it's not by might, nor by strength or power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. And that's a dangerous thing to, to, to consider. And there's three things I want us to, to not only be encouraged by, but hopefully get hopeful, hope in. And it's this, that God's power comes so we can um, uh, conquer great obstacles. God's power comes to empower us so that we can... Um, overcome small beginnings. Uh, God's power comes to us um, so that we know that God uses unlikely people. Because that's what we see here in verse 4. Consider the first thing, great obstacles. One thing the enemy loves to do is to discourage you into saying to you, you think you can do that, but you can't. Right? That, that project is too monumental. That task is, is too great. There's no way you can do what is set before you. And, when, and you guys know my phrase, right? Whenever someone says no way, you say Yahweh. That's, that's the response right there. No way. No way. You guys are good. So God can do the impossible, right? This is why right after verse 6, look at verse 7. It says, what are you, O great mountain? Meaning, there's a great mountain there. Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. Meaning, with God's Spirit, whatever great obstacle lies before you is nothing when it comes to the work of God. Because Jesus did not promise this, did he not, in Matthew 16? That he will build his church and even the gates of hell shall not stand against it. God's work will get done, but it will get done only by means of his spirit. Know with certainty this, God's work will get done, amen? But it will only get done by means of his spirit. Whatever great obstacle lies in front of you, you need to know that you need to stop looking around you and look within. You need to stop looking around you and go to God's truth. You need to stop looking around you and just depend upon the work of God because what he wants done will get done. Probably one of the movies I'm looking forward to the most this summer is a movie called Dunkirk. Some of you have probably seen the trailer already. Uh, I'm going to give you a little background on Dunkirk, specifically the miracle at Dunkirk. Talk about overcoming great obstacles. World War II, May 1940, the Third Reich and, it's, and Hitler and his army is moving across Europe and has 400,000 British soldiers pinned between them and the English Channel. They're on the coast of France, and they've got nowhere to go. Hitler and his army is about 10 miles away. These 400,000 British troops think they are doomed. At that moment when they, they felt like there was no way out, that they're facing this insurmountable obstacle... Churchill and the king at the time issue a call to prayer in England. And the night that this radio address goes out to call England to pray, Hitler decides to stop the movement of his army, even to the dismay of his generals and other leadership. They didn't know what he was up to, but he said, we don't need to move forward right now which gave now the British time to consider they're out. Historians to this day don't know why Hitler made the decision that night to stop the movement of his troops. That's the first miracle of Dunkirk. The second miracle of Dunkirk then 
was to figure out how we get across the English Channel because there was no way they were going any other direction but across the Channel. So that night, 400 plus boats were released across the Channel. Fishermen, private boats, passenger boats, all the boats they can muster were sent across the Channel to go rescue their fathers and their brothers and their sons. Well, what happened the next night was this huge storm came over the region. Enough so it kept the the German troops at bay, but not enough that they couldn't move up the beach to Dunkirk, which was the only free port at France to get these guys off off the coast. But what's amazing is the rain stopped at the coast, which allowed all the boats to get across the channel without being affected by the weather. Miracle number two. Miracle number three... Those boats land, pick up their troops. Almost all those men, 400,000 men, were rescued. Which was impossible to any historian's imagination. It was impossible to anyone's uh, ability to comprehend the magnitude of what it would take. But 300 and about 50,000 men were rescued from Dunkirk. At this very pivotal moment, and people would say was a major turning point in, the, in World War II. That next Sunday, the churches were filled with people. And they were filled with people singing to God and reading Psalm 124. Turn to Psalm 124 if you would. And here's what they read in the Psalms. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side... Had it not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, they would have swallowed us alive. Their anger was kindled against us. The waters would have engulfed us. The stream would have swept over our soul. The raging waters would have swept over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of a snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who has made both heaven and earth. Is that not awesome? So now you guys are like, we can go see this movie, (laughs) right? And again, I don't know how they're going to capture it, but ladies and gentlemen, what you have to realize is that sometimes when you realize is that all your resources have been spent, all your wisdom has been exhausted, you turn to the Lord your God who is the God of the impossible. And he shows up in ways you never thought imaginable. And then when God delivers, especially he delivers those whom he loves and cares about, all glory goes to him. Amen? My prayer for you is that you would understand that there may be obstacles in our lives. You may be weighed down by past guilt. You may be weighed down by past shame. You may have made some mistakes financially. You may have made mistakes morally. I don't know what you've, you've done in your past, but all I know is that God is a God of the present and a God of the future, and He can use any one of us for His glory, overcome those great obstacles by the help of His Spirit, and I pray that you would feel His power within you. That m- God is in the, in the business of using men and women who don't have the capacity to do what He wants us to do. That's why He has created us the way He has, because He doesn't want us to take the glory. He gets it. All the time, every time. Amen? So not only does God overcome great obstacles, number two, He is a God who allows us to overcome even the smallest beginnings. Because you remember when the temple was starting to be rebuilt? People were criticizing it because it was nothing compared to Solomon's temple. And that's why in verse 10, he says, if we go back to Zechariah, Oh, this is a tough one. To find. Who, who put their little ribbon tab in the place that can easily find it? There it is. Zechariah chapter 4. Look at verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? See, there were the critics that said, how's God going to bless this? This is nothing compared to what it was like in the past. See, has anyone ever come to your life to despise what you would see as maybe insignificant or trivial? See, I'm, I'm in the business of ministry and it's easy to get together with other pastors and you know the conversation that usually ensues in conversations between pastors is hey how big's your church and the moment you don't measure up to some other pastor at the table you just kind of want to just shirk down 
put your head in your, between your knees and just wish for the lunch to pass quickly, right? You, you feel like, well, compared to this person, my work is not important. Compared to that guy, our ministry is not that significant. And I want you to know something. That is a lie from the enemy that is designed to in, in, discourage you. I want you to know that if you, if you take that theory to its logical end, Jesus was an utter failure because he only had 12 guys that he, he, he journeyed with, right? Like, you need to understand that God does not measure success by the size of your church. He doesn't measure success for the number of people that are following you. He measures success by how faithful you are to what he has called you to do because at the end of the day, you're not in control of how these things work out. God is the determiner of size. God is the determiner of impact. God is the determiner of influence. He doesn't ask you to be responsible for those things. He just says, you need to be faithful. Amen? So someone comes along, and we're going to call those people in our churches, they're the cold water committee. Do you guys know people that are part of the cold water committee? Uh, they, the committee, they come in and you have an idea, and they just kind of throw water, cold water on it to try to douse the fire, to try, try to get rid of your enthusiasm. I want you to know that God is honored not just in great things, he's honored in small things when they're done in his name, by his spirit. I know of a church that I read about years ago in Texas Small church, like Missio Day. We're a small church, but I like small churches. God loves small churches, right? Some of you are like, I want it to stay small. I don't want it to grow. Hey, that's up to God. That's up to God. But this church that is a small church has planted 50 plus churches all around the world. More than a lot of mega churches have ever planted. Some mega churches haven't even planted one. Why? Because they're concerned with building their own kingdom and they're con not concerned about the bigger kingdom. I'm not saying that's true for all churches. But that's, that's the mentality of some. So don't despise small things. Don't despise the things that you sit there because, you know what, the world measures things that we can see, results-driven, that are tangible. And I want you to know that God sees the unseen. He sees the pastor on his knees praying for his church community. He sees the laborers in the church every Sunday grinding it out to do the work of the Lord in the kids' ministry. God sees those things. And don't you dare discount the fact that he sees those things and he's delighted when he sees the people of God at work. No matter the size, no matter the impact, no matter the influence. So don't let someone come along and say, oh, your church is, not, n is nothing compared to that church. Don't come along and say, you think you're, you're, you're a good speaker? That guy's a better speaker over there. You know what Moody said? Dwight Moody said this, I know a lot of people who can preach the gospel better than me, but no one can preach a better gospel. Amen? That's it right there, baby. You know, when you talk about Dunkirk and you hear Rachmaninoff and you quote Moody, it's a, it's a good service, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's a great service. So uh, third point is this, is that God uses unlikely people. Think about the, the phrase at the end of verse 14, anointed ones. Who are the anointed ones? And these are the ones that are in the vision at these trees, these olive trees, commissioned to do the work. They are Zerubbabel and Joshua, the political leader and the spiritual leader. Two unlikely people that God has called his anointed ones. You know, what? if they're his anointed ones, guess what you are in Christ? You're also his anointed one. And again, do not discount your education. Do not discount your experience. Do not discount your know-it-all or know-with-all or, 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 or anything. You need to know that God is in the business of using unlikely people. He uses shepherds. He uses men. He uses women. He uses tall. He uses short. He uses thin. He uses fat. He uses all sorts of people to do his work. What he's looking for more than anything is an available heart. Zerubbabel and Joshua were men that were just available to be used by God. And God said, I'm going to use you. But notice, they're just the channels and vessels by which God does his work. It has nothing to do with you at the end of the day. It has to do with him working in you and through you. That's the work of ministry, you guys. Be encouraged that God is a God who empowers his people to do the work of ministry. 
That God is a God who says, you know what? The greater your sail becomes in faithfulness, the greater I can propel you across the spiritual ministry waters to do what I've called you to do. Because is it, this, is it the size of the mast or is it the size of the boat or is it the expense you put into making sure the boat's where it needs to be? No, it's the dependency upon the wind. And at the end of the day, you and I are dependent upon the wind of the Spirit of God. Amen? Chapter 5. We could probably stop right there, huh? Should we? No, let's keep going. Quickly. Jesus is the delivering one. Verse 5, chapter 5. And, and what I'm going to do at this point is I'm just going to summarize what's happening. You guys can read it for yourselves. In chapter 5, there then is a vision of this flying scroll going across the sky. It's kind of like when you're at the beach and there's that plane that just keeps flying back and forth with your favorite insurance company on it. Like, everyone sees it, right? Everyone acknowledges it. It's like, okay, dude, move down the coast. We're tired of hearing that. <laughs> right i've seen enough geckos in my time right let's move on i want to hear the sound of the waves not the sound of your motor so this flying scroll goes across the sky and on the scroll are the commandments of god everyone in the world can see the commandments of god and the flying scroll is given to show people what god requires the law but yet what man and woman fail to live up to the law and so there's, three, there's four points of, of sin I want to talk about briefly. One is rooted sin. Rooted sin. Number two is revealed sin. Number three is... Anyone want to take a guess? R- r- okay, keep going. <laughs> Removed sin and the last one is where are my notes this is the uh, rejecting sin rejecting in another word i'm going to give you another some c's we're going to make this the morning of alliteration all right so there's corruption there's conviction there's cleansing and then there's cherishing Let me talk about these briefly. The scroll reveals something that's true for any one of us. All of us are tainted by sin. All of us are sinners by nature. We don't, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's important to understand. Things that go on in Manchester and things that go on in London, things that go on in New York, things that go on in in Los Angeles, things like whatever we're talking about is that there's a root issue going on in our world that people have a hard time putting their finger on. And it's the issue that every single person born into this world is a sinner. There's rooted sin. That's the problem. This is why Jesus came to free us from our sinful nature and to give us a divine nature, the Christ nature. So there's rooted sin, which is corruption. God then sends the law, which then is, it, it, it provokes conviction. This is why this, the banner goes across the world for people to see the commandments, and we shirk away from the commandments because we can't measure up to those things. See, God reveals His expectation, His requirements. It's called the law. None of us could ever measure up to the law. That's not why the Ten Commandments were given. The Ten Commandments were given to drive us to Jesus. Because while we can't, He does. And this is the beauty of the third point. He's the one who removes sin. He's the cleansing agent given by God who says, I will stand in your place, be your substitute, and do what you could never do for yourself. That's why we sing the songs we sing. Man of sorrows, right? He has done it all. And we are now the beneficiaries of his obedience. We are the beneficiaries of his faithfulness. We're corrupted, then we're convicted. Thank God he doesn't leave us in that place, but he gives us a way out. That way out is a person, his name is Jesus. That's where cleansing happens. And then what happens after cleansing? You walk in the freedom 
that now that your sin has been removed and now you live a life of rejecting that which you used to be in bondage to and now you don't cherish sin anymore, you cherish righteousness. You cherish holiness. You cherish obedience. You cherish the things that God cherishes and you have disdain for the things that stand in the way of you and your maker. You and your Savior. This is what Jesus does to deliver us. And so the scroll goes across the mountain, vision one. Then there's this picture of a woman in a basket that represents wickedness, is the next vision. You can read about that later. And that basket has a seal on top of it that can't be removed because when God takes care of wickedness, He does it and it's never to be brought up again. And He delivers that basket to the land of Shinar, which is where the Tower of Babel was built, displaying man's exaltation and their desire to dethrone God. And God takes wickedness to that place and judges it and says, never again will pride of man be raised against the holiness that I have. Those are the visions in chapter 5. Some of you are like, ooh, i got to read this. This is good. Then there's the vision of the horses going out to judge the world. This is the picture of Christ delivering his people from the very thing we need to be delivered from, that is sin. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Praise God for a delivering one. He has rescued us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that you can know freedom. Amen? This is why God does what he does. To make for himself a new people. A people who are empowered by the Spirit, who shine their light, which is ultimately not a light of themselves, it's a light from God, who hopefully display righteousness and and holiness to the world so that there could be a hunger that's created that they sit there and go, we want what they they have. Because Jesus is the answer, you guys. Which then brings us to the last point, the crown one. You guys like how fast we move through point two? We covered a lot of stuff right there. But then there's this picture. Look at verse 6, chapter 6. Verse 9. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Take an offering from the exiles. Verse 11. Take the silver and the gold. Make an ornate crown. Set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. This was unusual. Because the priest didn't receive the crown. A political leader usually received the crown. This is, a, this is a, a picture of the coronation of a king. But the, the idea here is how can a priest who's doing religious service now occupy the role of a king? What I'm going to show you is that this is a pu- picture of the future Jesus being the crowned one who will be both king and priest. Look at verse 12. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch. Circle that word. What that means is literally sprout. What it means is shoot. This is a insignificant little part of the plant that most of us would just pass by and just ignore because guess what? It, it, it's not doing anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's not significant. I don't know if you, you guys know, but there are some big trees in this world. Anyone ever been to like Sequoia National Park? King, King, there's some mighty trees there. Trees you can drive through. That's how big they are. But guess how those trees started? They started as like a little acorn, a little seed, a little something. What's amazing is this goes back to the point we talked about just moments ago. What is seemingly insignificant in the eyes of the world can grow into the most powerful force in the world. This picture of the branch is the picture of Jesus who is the shoot of Jesse, born into the world, into obscurity, borrowed stable, manger, smelly animals. No one thought any of him, anything of him. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Even the world did not esteem him. And yet, even though the world thought the ministry of Jesus as insignificant, we know the mountain-moving power of the ministry and person work of Jesus, do we not? That the crown one is this branch who out from where he is, he will build the temple of the Lord. And the temple is not a building made with hands. The temple is his body. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord 
He who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne, thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. He embodies two things, and these are the two points in your notes. As priest, he has a permanent priesthood. And as king, he has eternal or everlasting dominion. And verse 15 says, Those who are far off will come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And it will take place if you completely obey the Lord your God. Let's just round it out right now. Christ being the crown one has incredible significance for us now and forever. Because as priest, he has given the one sacrifice that matters more than any other sacrifice, his own life. And you need to know that because he is the supreme and ultimate sacrifice, there are now no sacrifices needed. Amen? We don't need to go with bulls and goats and pigeons and doves and go before our God with with sacrifices. We need to believe in him who is the one true sacrifice whose permanent priesthood is counted for all who have believed in him. Praise God for such an incredible high priest, Jesus. But secondly, praise God for a king who rules wisely, who rules kindly, whose throne will never be usurped. His everlasting dominion will be exactly that forever and ever and ever. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. But the one kingdom that will reign forever is the kingdom of the branch, the shoot of Jesse, Jesus' himself. That's the hope. This is why we keep doing what we're doing. Because we have an eternal priest. We have this everlasting dominion. That's what I want to be a part of. Something that is significant, that will outlast me, but ultimately be for God's glory. How about you? You want to be a part of that too? You guys have been awesome. Next week, chapters 7 and 8. Maybe we'll, we'll have some more time to unpack things a little bit more evenly. I, f- I feel like I, I come at you with a fire hydrant, and you guys are like trying to get a sip of water, and it's just like. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff here, isn't it? And who would ever think Zachariah? Like you just pass right by and go, I can't pronounce the guy's name. I'm not going to read it, you know? So good truth here. Let's continue to honor our, our Lord, our Savior. The empowering one, the delivering one, the crown one, he is worthy of our praise. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you're good. You're awesome. Thank you for the, the word which is living and active. Thank you that the, the, the writings, the prophecy you've given Zechariah not only means something significant for him, but means something significant for us. We are truly loved in ways that we never thought possible. We're truly accepted in ways we never thought possible. Lord, you're amazing in that you know us and yet you love us. And not only do you love us, that you want to use us for your purposes. That is, that is mind-boggling. My prayer is that you would guide our steps, direct our ways, teach us to what it means to be de- dependent upon the Spirit, to live lives where sometimes the only explanation is you but to be fully yielded, fully obedient people because we've received such a great love. Lord, may our words and our deeds bring you great glory. Thank you for all that you've given us in Jesus. We praise in his name. Amen. Before you depart, if you're interested in being baptized, quick little Q&A right over here. If you desire prayer this morning, we want to make our leaders available to you. I'm going to have Kevin and Donna Fagerberg over here, Mike Bachmeyer over here, Norm Davis over here. If you desire prayer, see one of them and they would love to pray for you. In the meantime, you're loved and we're being...